Coming up on this week's Real Country File, Stephen visits an Aladdin's cave of tractors. Angela is at the Cheshire Grassland Farm Walk. I speak to some vets at Cheshire Show and we hear from Thornbridge Small Holdings as well. So I'm here with my mate uh, David Martin. David, uh, you're about to lead us on into uh, Aladdin's uh, cave, is that right? A bit of a grotto of tractors? <coughs> well, I hope so. Some are pretty and some are not. <laughs> <laughs> let's have a look then, let's have a wonder. So what if we got it back here then, dear? This one a bit uh, dif <coughs> different looking. The red one is a Ukrainian tractor. It belongs to a friend of mine, he's brought it early to the show. And uh, he has a, a big board for the back of this. And he had a Russian tractor, but he said, I've sold the Russian tractor. Uh, this is a Ukrainian tractor, up yours, Mr. Putin. Fair comment. <laughs> so what have we got here then, uh, David? That's a 62 David Brown 990. I bought it off a friend of mine uh, at uh, Ellswick, John Nuttall. They've had it a long time at their farm. And what have we got in front? This is a 20... What, that's it, in front of that with loader? That's an old International B250. Right, and then this one here? That's a David Brown 25C petrol paraffin. That's a good running tractor. It, it just wants uh, a battery on it. Bit of fettling. Somebody here looks like, did it have a cab once over this? This would have, yeah. That's a German International. 533. Yeah. And then in front of that's a Nuffield, is it? A Nuffield 345. That's an absolutely cracking tractor. But a chap bought it to do ply matches, but then he's got arthritis and he couldn't do it anymore, so I bought it. And that's next to another Nuffield just here in distance. Is it? That's a 460, is it? That yeah, there? 460, yeah. Yeah, that's... That uh, looks a bit of a beast. Yeah, it is, that one. And then in front of us here, looks in a bit of a sorry state. What have we got here? An Alice Chalmers B for spares. For spares? Is that for spares for this next do we? Uh, no, no, we haven't used any of that. That's a restored one. It came from David Harrison at, um, near Widnes. He's on that um, coast to coast run this weekend, I think. All oh, right, so he's one of them that were on last week's show. Yeah. Right, this is no, they won't get so far on coast to coast on this particular machine, would it? No, it'd take no. a bit of doing. Yeah, but it's a nice thing, it is a nice thing. Wow, what a collection! This is a Fordson Major straight off a farm, a lovely old thing. I'm just going to leave it alone, it doesn't want touching, it drives like a new one, looks slightly older. And then some, some narrow tyres on this fella. Yeah, this is a Ferguson High Clearance petrol paraffin. Just have a look how high up that is at back. And how long have you had most of these tractors? Or how long have you been collecting? Oh, a few years. 20 or 30 years. It's a disease, you know. Is it really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But once you start, you can't stop. No, no. A bonny thing, David. David Brown, 12, 12. But uh, the question is, will she start? <laughs> like a little sewing machine. That's a David Brown 880 he bought up a farm at Samuelsbury. Um, we just painted it, but mechanically it was okay. What a collection. And as you said, it's a disease. It's uh, certainly uh, filling every gap that you've got. Let's have a look down this list. David Brown 780, this what's that here? A Japanese international imported from Japan, made so by Komatsu for international. So that's a rare beast then? Yeah, it is. It is in this country. And then that looks that looks different there, Kramer. Yeah, that's a German tractor. I think it'd be East German when that was made, 1950s. Uh, it's done very little work from you. That'll start and run. There's one or two that start and one or two that don't, is that right? Well, they just have flat batteries, you know, they won't start, but they will be all got ready for the show. Uh, this one here, this 
780. Mother, my mother bought that new in 69, a year after my dad died in 1968. And uh, she sold it and we found out where it was and got it back and repainted it. But it's done very little work from new, it's only done 2,000 something hours. It's an Oliver, made by David Brown, they made 2,000 of them and sent them to America for Oliver's to sell because they had the tractor that size. And um, that's been to America and come back but we painted it. But it runs very well and it's, it's a nice little thing. But it's a David Brown 850 underneath really. Straight grill on it. That's the Mitsubishi underneath. I don't know why it's covered up. Obviously, keep dust off. That's a Mitsubishi, about 18 horsepower. That's an Alice Chalmers that came from a farm at Wharton. Um, Ted Fenton at Brown's farm. He said, Come and I'm moving house. Come and buy me tractor because my lads will only put it in a skip. Oh no! <laughs> no. We, we can't have that. So from tractors to grassland in Cheshire. Right, I've got my wellies, I've got my directions, I'm off to a farm walk. So it's a beautiful summer's evening here in Cheshire and I'm at another farming event. So Colin, tell us a little bit about where we are and what we're doing here. Uh, Cheshire Grassland Society, this is our summer farm walk, courtesy of this gentleman here. We, uh, we meet at Rees Heath six times every winter and have uh, presentations normally of a variety of people, what's topical and sometimes what's not topical but it's interesting. Then we have normally a couple of summer farm walks, we have a, a grassland competition in the summer, stylish competition in the winter and sometimes when we haven't got Covid around we have a trip somewhere in the country but tonight we're courtesy of this gentleman Stephen. So Stephen just give us an overview of uh, of this farm and what you do here. Right so um, this farm Chris Birch Hall farm uh, we farm 600 acres with the main aim to feed 300 cows to produce milk uh, they carve all year round and yeah that's what we do. Um, every cow is fed to yield within the parlour and that's partly what the collars do so the collars do um, do rumen function, they do um, yeah, rumen function, bulling and heat signs and also their, they're like their parlour passport as such so we know what exactly how much milk they've given. So um, the parlour was completed two, two months after we started milking here and they were an interesting two months in a bale and um, it took um, four and a half hours twice a day to milk the herd and that was 160 at the time and within two weeks of getting in this parlour we got back down to two and a half hours uh, for 320 so we went so we doubled the numbers and half the time and um, it's a two-man parlour so one person's prepping so it's uh, free free white free strip and uh, looking out for anything with mastitis or any other issues and then the second person is putting on units. I'm here with John from ACT. So John, just tell us what your involvement on this farm is. Uh, we, we supply the feed uh, to the, for the dairy herd and the calf feed, the rearing nuts and the dry cow rolls and also the, the blend that's outside. Uh, we also supply the maize seed and the fodder beet seed. Uh, this year Stephen's growing Dignity and Excel on the maize seed and then growing Kairos and Brit for the fodder beet. Um, yeah, so we take uh, grass samples every, every fortnight and to see on the, on the grazing. And, uh, so what does the grass sample tell you? It tells you the, the the amount of milk you're going to get, expect from grazing, it also gives you the protein, the dry matter, um, and the N and the NDF. So, it gives you quite a a good a good indication on what what to expect from that week's grazing of the cows. Because with the change of the weather, obviously the grass changes quite <laughs> regular as well. 
So, so depending on how the, the grass has grown that particular week, you'll be able to alter the feed requirements coming up. Is, is that yeah. how it works then? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So it's so another management tool for Stephen to use um, in feeding the cows. So. In the milking parlour here, I'm now with Emrys from GEA, the uh, milking parlour specialists, and we've been discussing these interesting pads here. So just explain to us what, what they do. Yeah, these are what we call iPads. And um, the name iPad derives from Platform Universal Device, Intelligent Platform Universal Device. And they do numerous things, really. Number one, when the cow comes on the deck, it keeps the cow's legs apart. So it makes putting the milking machine easier on the cow for the operator. Number two, if you suspect that the cow has mastitis, you can strip one of the quarters into it. And obviously, if there are any mastitis, you'll see specks um, or clots in, on, in the pud. And then thirdly and lastly, once the cow has finished milking, about 10 seconds afterwards, these two nozzles cross fire and they put some spray, some iodine or whatever chemical on the teats. So it's quite a clever little piece of kit, really, that does numerous things on the rotary parlour. Mm -hmm. So this is the milking cluster. And when the cluster comes to the bridge, it's normally in this position. But what happens automatically, the cluster then drops down. And the reason for that is when the cow is backing off, she can't get herself tangled up in the rubber way. Once the cluster goes under the bridge, then automatically the cluster is lifted up here and it's here ready for the operator to put on the next cow. So this particular parlour, how long, approximately, does it take to do one rotation? Um, earlier on, Steve was telling us that at the moment his cows are giving a lot of milk. So I would say this would be most probably doing something like a 10-minute rotation in the morning when they're very full of milk, and most probably a 9-minute rotation in the afternoon when they haven't got quite as much milk on them. Um, other thing that he's got on this rotary are these straps, which we call cow retention straps. So if the cow kicks the machine off, the strap comes down and she has to come round again. Or if the cow's yield is below a certain amount, um, it, it can be programmed that she comes round again. Um, and another thing as well, if you want the cow to come round again for whatever reason, you can manually get it down so the cow can't back off on the bridge. Excellent. So the last thing you want is a cow going off out of the parlour when she's not finished being milked. Definitely, you know? yes. <laughs> Part of the enjoyment and success of these evenings is the, uh, the chit-chat, the catching up, the social aspects and of course the catering. So this evening, what have we been dining on? Uh, you've been on homemade beef burgers um, and we've got organised, we've, we've catered for you, we've organised, we've cooked the burgers and as you can see we've run out. Um, and it's just lovely to see everybody around chatting and organising and doing. Um, I'm quite pleased, you know, all the burgers are done, there's no fat left over, everybody's smiling. That'll do for me. That's it's it. It's nice to be out again. It is, yeah, nice to be able to catch up with people. Who doesn't love a farm walk? I've learnt a lot tonight. I've caught up with a load of people that I've not seen for a long time and I've been well fed with a locally produced burger. Brilliant. Now while I was at Cheshire Show this week I got talking to the vet school because they were there trying to encourage more people to apply for, apply for vet places. Anyway, very interesting some of the things they were saying. Apparently a lot of teachers do try to put people off joining the veterinary courses because they say it's too difficult and more difficult than being a doctor, which is a bit of a shame and there's a bit of a shortage at the moment, especially male vets. So if you're male and you fancy doing a university course with lots of females, that's probably the course for you being a vet. So anyway, there's a little bit about that. So I'm at Cheshire Show and I'm talking to the University of Liverpool Vet School. And I'm talking to Hannah. Hello. I remember the name. And she was telling me before, which I thought was really interesting, what was it you were telling me? You were telling me that people aren't applying to be vets because... So veterinary science is considered to be a, a profession for a certain group of people, which is absolutely not true. What we're finding is that we're getting more and more young ladies applying and not getting much diversity. So what I'm saying now is for people to actually think about becoming a vet, 
and what they could do with a veterinary science degree. It's not just looking at animals and looking at clinical practice. It's an investment for your future. And in particular, some of our core diversity groups are multicultural groups, um, actually boys. Not many boys apply for veterinary science. So we've only got about 20% of our applicant pool are male. Um, so, so, so just to interrupt, sorry. So boys, if you want to go to university and have a good time, maybe you should look at a career in being a vet. Yeah, and I think you'd have an amazing career at the end of it. It's a brilliant investment in your future, great degree to have. You're always going to get a job. It's a relatively well-paid profession. I think you can't go wrong. And you said something as well about if you don't get your grades, you can do, is it a foundation? Yeah, so there are different ways to get in. So the most straightforward way is you get your GCSEs, your A-levels, and you come through the traditional entry route. But if you don't get in that way, there are lots of other ways, so don't give up. It is not impossible, and one of the biggest messages I can say is if you have somebody tell you it's impossible to get in, nobody gets in, there's fairly any, very few places, that's just not true. So if you do know you want to be a vet, you can come and do it as a postgraduate. Some of the universities offer foundational gateway courses, so you can come in that way. Access courses through some of the agricultural colleges. So you can find a method to get yourself in if that's what you really want to do. And if your teachers try to talk you out of it, saying it's a difficult profession, it takes a lot of training, don't be put off by that because there's enough help and there's enough skills yeah. in the teachers to get you a pass. Yeah, get you in. And most vets start on what? 30,000. 30, 30,000 a year. Yeah. And then some of them specialise in different things and then you can go on to do other bits or genetics or... Yeah, yeah research. Yeah. AstraZeneca, Pfizer, CEOs, both of them are vets and they made the COVID vaccines. So there you go. Good career is veterinary. Yeah. Thank you anyway. You're welcome. Some pigs getting loaded behind us. <laughs> I'm not happy about it because they've been picked up. Also have this sent in the other week from Thornbridge Smallholders. A little video that they've done and edited themselves. So if anyone has any videos like this, please send them in and get in touch and we can put them in. Hi Ali, uh, it's Matt Harrison here from the Thornbridge Smallholding. I uh, just thought I'd quickly do this video uh, to send to you um, just a little bit about myself. Um, so I'm not from a farming background, but I have always been interested in agriculture. Um, I, I, I started by buying some chickens uh, with some pocket money at the age of 10. Uh, that's how I started. And then from there I ended up buying some sheep, some ewes uh, to breed with. And then from there we ended up going into uh, Gloucester Old Spot Pigs, which are keeping the woodland here at Thornbridge. I've currently got about, uh, there's 30 in the woods and there's three breeding sows. Uh, we also then um, went into Dexter, Dexter Beef, uh, which is why I do that. We bought some pygmy goats, uh, not really as a money making thing, but it was more of a sort of a, a, an attraction. Um, because the other thing we do here at Thornbridge is, uh, we're, well, we're, we're really privileged. Uh, we're a, a lovely uh, an amazing stately home. So I'll just flip the camera around. So that's uh, Thornbridge Hall. Um, the hall and the gardens sit on about 10 acres alone. Uh, Our gardens um, open to the public so people can come and have a look around our gardens. Um, Monday to Sunday and uh, 10 till 4 so if you were, are ever in the Derbyshire Peak District National Park area um, then do pop in come and visit us um, and uh, yeah I'll quickly just show you a few bits all the all the meat and everything that we produce on site is also butchered on site um, all the sausages are made by me bacon the whole lot so um, yes I, I am proud to say I'm not from a farm background. So we'll also just quickly go through a bit of a walk around uh, so you can see some of the animals we've got as well. So uh, we're just at the back end of lambing. Um, these are our uh, ewes and lambs that we've currently got out in the field. Uh, we do lamb in that marquee just down there um, because unfortunately we haven't got a building. Um, we've got some pigs over here so we'll quickly have to take a walk over here and see them. Okay. Yeah, I bought myself one of these um, Corvus um, gators. The, so far, touch wood, it's been a great piece of kit uh, and love it. 
so yes also tractor wise we bought a um, new holland t6 uh, 175 um, i've had it now for about six years um, and to be honest with you i don't know how we coped without it so we will just go and have a look at the chickens and goats and then move on to the dexters before heading off to see the last of the pigs So these are our two pygmy goats and um, the chickens have obviously only just been let out because of the bird flu situation. What are you two doing? Hey? What are you two doing? So here's another pen of pigs, but I'll not bother showing you anymore because they're all the same, but different uh, ages. So yeah, this is our little uh, butchery area, um, our processing area. This is where we uh, literally, so we breed the animals on site and then it literally has a 20 minute, half an hour trip uh, to the abattoir and then we bring it back uh, and then it comes into this room and we uh, process it, make um, joints, burgers, pies, uh, sausages, bacon, um, you name it, we, we do it in here. Um, I mean, this is our pastry machine, uh, so we make all our own pastry as well. Um, and um, yeah, so it's literally everything's on site apart from the trip to the so abattoir. Yeah, I hope you've enjoyed that uh, sort of like uh, little tour um, and uh, one thing I just want to finish on is that um, obviously all the meat products I am churning out and making um, I'm trying my best to create products uh, that have got beer in them so uh, because Obviously I feed all my uh, livestock on uh, the grain and the yeast from the Thornbridge Brewery. Um, so, you know, and then to have a product like sausages that have got um, one of our most popular beers, uh, Jaipur in it. So a Jaipur sausage, um, I've started doing um, stout, cure, uh, stout cured bacon and I've got um, some pork apple and stout burgers and and products like that you see um, so keep your eye out and they're, they're the kind of products you'll uh, you'll see um, coming out of this room but yeah thank you very much guys and we'll see you on the next one cheers that is about it for the real country file this week we've had 1.3 mil of rain in the last seven days which is just not enough what have you had this week anyway thanks for watching hope you've liked and subscribed and i'll see you next week